العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Uh, we praise Allah subhanahu wa taala. We send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger, Sayyidina Rasulullah, صلى الله عليه وسلم, upon his family, العتريه, uh, his companions. Uh, and those who follow them till the end of time. Uh, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. MashaAllah, it's good to be back here in the area. As many of you know, perhaps I used to live in DC and 14th and V. MashaAllah. In Adams Morgan. Adams uh, Morgan was an interesting place. And uh, alhamdulillah, I was able to work there with Sister Lauren and Brother Muhammad, those of you who know them. Uh, and do some work with Center DC uh, and teach at, at Adams uh, Center some years ago. And then my wife is from Silver Spring, so I have no choice but to be here <laughs> from time to time and check in on the fam, as we say. So it's, uh, it's great to be here and see you know, people who I've known for a long time, alhamdulillah, uh, and some old friends. Uh, so it's interesting, you know, the topic that I was given is something I've been thinking about for a while, especially um, being now Muslim, subhanAllah, for 27 years. Um, and, and seeing, you know, my, my focus is really on the American Muslim community. That's the community that I live with. Um, and I put that first. And paying attention to kind of the transitions within that community as best I can from my, my vantage point and to try to understand perhaps where it's headed, not to simply fall into a, a reactionary uh, state of affairs. And, and one of the things that I see is that this is an tr incredibly traumatic time to be Muslim in America, as it is traumatic for many communities uh, in this country. And, and with that trauma, 
sometimes can come confusion. And, you know, the Quran warns us, well, fitna to a shadum al qatl. You know, trial is worse than death. Being in a state of fitna uh, can be worse than death. And, and to see our community in, in many respects reflect the confusion and trauma that's shared with many uh, in America. What concerns me is that while there certainly is intersectionality within those struggles, uh, and there is a great sense of empathy for others who also may be going through similarly difficult times, our approach towards shouldering fitna and making, through, making it through difficult times should not replicate that of other communities. We have a unique set of optics by which we engage life by. And since 2016 in particular, we see that America, in a large part, and understandably so, the discussion in America has been restricted to simply the constitutional. People are highly political. Understandably so. But at the same time, within the framework of American politics is the salient problem of secularism. And we as Muslims, we're critical of secularism, and we should be openly critical of secularism. That doesn't mean that we're necessarily bad, and we'll talk about the assumption of being critical of secularism that comes within a post-enlightenment West. But when I look at the conferences across the country, and I see who's invited. I've been invited, so I throw myself in that lot. I haven't been able to go. But I see what's celebrated. What I see is a community now that strictly celebrates political accomplishments or social agency. Because an outcome of Islamophobia is to condition us to the point that any leftovers that society will give us to tell us we're OK, man, we'll be happy to, to, to eat those leftovers. We're not, we're not ready for the T-bone steak, but we'll take your leftovers. So I see a community that has been impacted gravely by circumstance and that's impacted how we look at life. And I don't see a community that necessarily sec celebrates its religious accomplishments. Doesn't celebrate accomplishments of young men and women who may not necessarily be successful politically or socially or culturally. And that worries me because the political reflection of the West and the cultural reflection of the West may be at odds with our religion. And the political reflection of the West and the cultural reflection of the West may reflect ethics which we, we don't recognize as being ethical. So what I'd like to talk about briefly is creating a framework of values that we can use to think about and evaluate ourselves. Because I'm not, I'm not also saying, you know, everything is impossible to work with or everything should be considered irredeemable. It's, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is I see a community that, you know, 20 years ago, Isna was celebrating Imam Siraj speaking at Isna. Now it's Trevor Noah. I don't have a problem with Trevor Noah. I don't think he's very funny. <laughs> but I don't necessarily want to celebrate that in an unhealthy way. I remember, and this is not to attack Isna, I'm just using that as an example. I remember that years ago we were apt to celebrate the accomplishments of the, the, the religious component of our community. And also acknowledge, and there was an extreme back then, we wouldn't have invited Trevor Noah at all, right? That's a different extreme. But what concerns me is a lack of balance. 
And, and we've been through it. No religious community in America has suffered politically, economically, culturally, and socially, been torn to pieces like the Ummah of the Prophet We're hurt, man, we've been wounded. Chuck doesn't play. So we may be inadvertently looking for acceptance in ways that are unhealthy. We may even have a little Stockholm Syndrome. So what I would like us to think about, and these are just some ramblings that I've been kind of grinding in my brain for a while. There's nothing too coherent, so lower your expectations. Is how can we formulate a framework for ethics that will allow us to look at our situation and make sure that we're, we're acting Islamically instead of reacting to what's going on around us. And it's interesting that we talk about al qiyam values. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. I tend to move on the progressive left. I like to call it the orthodox left or the orthodox progressive Muslim community, which is certainly interesting. We can unpack that for hours. And I was talking to a, a brother who, who's an activist. And I said to him, what is the theo in your activism? He said, what do you mean? I said, what is the religious language that guides your activism within the community why would you, that, that, that you serve? And he said to me, I don't have a language for that. This is what I'm getting into. He doesn't have a frame. He doesn't have a way to look at activism from a set of like broader meta religious guidelines, values. There's a brother I know, he's kind of like a, a red pill Muslim. I didn't know those existed. And so, you know, he tries to justify somehow being aligned with like libertarianism and neoconservatism. And I don't understand that, but he's still my friend. And I said to him, what, what is the language that guides your neoconservatism? Religious language that is like used to formulate your thought. And he had the same answer. Never thought about that. So on the left of the Muslim community and on the right of the Muslim community, these two people lack religious frames by which to think about the work they do. That's my point. So I want us to think today about like the values of Islam. And then how do we synthesize and apply those values uh, within the parameters of our life, our spheres of influence, our spheres of influence. I thought that was interesting because tonight he, he introduced me by mentioning the famous story of Sayyidina wa Imamina Malik, Imami Dar al-Hijra, rahimahullah. And the student that he's mentioning is Abdurrahman ibn Qasim, who is from Egypt. And listen to what I'm trying to say here. He mentioned that Abdurrahman ibn Qasim, he studied with Imam Malik for 24 years. But the narration is extremely important to, to, to give us a glimpse into the importance of values because religion without values is hypocrisy. Right? If someone is religious, but without a value system, they'll be a munafiq. So there's an external religiosity, but without values, haba'a manthura. Quran says it's like useless. So Abdurrahman ibn Qasim, he says, talamathu ala yid imam malik arbu ashrina sana. He said, as mentioned by Al-Qadi Iyad, he said, I studied with imam malik for 24 years. 22 of those years I learned Values. 22 years I learned akhlaq and character. And for two years I learned the knowledge, the ilm. In the most authentic narration, Abdurrahman ibn Qasim says, Waya Layt. He said, I wish, he lamented, I wish 
I can exchange those last two years of learning knowledge for learning values. So there's something deeper that values impacts us in a way than, say, just surface level things. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he talked about these values in general ways. He said, you know, أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَحْسَنَكُمْ خُلُقَ He said, al kamaqal, you know, the closest of you to me in the hereafter are people of values, people of ethics. He said in another narration, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when someone asked him, what are the keys to paradise? He said, Taqwa Allah wa husnu khuluq. Yani to be dutiful to God and to be a person of good character and good morality. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I believe when it comes to religious education, we failed our young people because we've taught them particulars before we taught them universals. We've created a community which is hyper juz'iyah, hyper particular, but doesn't have the ability to see in a bigger way. So it finds itself always caught up in little things. That's why Sayyidina Ash-Shatibi, Rahimahullah uh, Ta'ala, he said, you know, the challenge of a community which is constantly thinking about small particulars is they won't be able to like produce in a, a meta way, in an impactful way. And that's also a sign of a lack of character development. In the Quran we find the word for values and its derivatives used more than 700 times. Allahu Akbar. The word for values is qiyam. Qiyam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from one of his names, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's living al qayyum, yani aqama kulla shay. Bi amri. The one who establishes everything. Everything is because we're going to talk about this in a minute. Values is what allows us to scaffold. Business folks, values is, allow, is what as human beings allows us to stand. That's why standing in Arabic is called what? Qiyam, from the same word. Because if I have values, I can stand. If I have values, I can have Qiyam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa huwa qa'imun. Allah is standing, He's, Allah is in charge of and running the affairs on everything ma kasabat. And everything that happens, and of course we'll talk about this in a moment, in Aqidah, from Sifat As-Salbiya, Qa'imun bi nafs, Subhanahu wa Taala, the one who's completely independent. Another word that should comes from the word for values is Al-Qayyimah. Thalika Dinu Qayyimah. Shot al bayina. Fa'akim wajhaka li din al qayyim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, you should set yourself forward to the deen which is qayyim. Qayyim means la ifrat wa la tafrit. Yani there is no like too far to the left, too far to the right. There is no irrational conservatism or irresponsible liberalism in this deen. This deen is deen wasat, a balanced religion. And then, of course, in the Qur'an, this is something we can build on. One of the most important acts that we engage in daily, five times a day, is predicated on being able to stand and perform it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very beautifully, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ wa. Same word. Those who believe in the unseen and who establish salah. You know, the form is from if'al. So the form is they erected salah. 
how do you erect prayer? How do I erect prayer that as though prayer is an edifice? Is that within the salah there are values and morals? There's a sign of being committed to Allah, so I establish salah. And then, of course, there's physical responsibilities established to salah. The point I'm trying to make is, and maybe we can expand on this, that the idea of values, something which permeates, subhanAllah, our, our faith in different areas, whether it's theology, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qa'imun bidhatihi subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's independence, that's the foundation of tawheed, whether it's our deen, which is a deen which is qayyim, which is a deen, which, a religion, which, a faith, which is not to one side or the other, it's a deen which is balanced, alhamdulillah, and then I just gave another example in our practice that we establish salah. That salah has inter, internal and external integrals by which we live. So how is it that, and I'm just giving a little bit because of time, right? The entire edifice of religion, whether it's related to theology, whether it's related to tasawwuf, whether it's related to aqidah, whether it's related to practice and worship, whether it's related to spirituality, we find this different extractions of the word for values appearing in different places. Whether it's in our relationship with Allah, whether it's in our relationship with worship, whether it's how we conceptualize our religion. So obviously, values are something important because they permeate the entire deen, subhanAllah. Now that takes us to thinking about how we can formulate and format our values. And of course, the first, and, 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 and as we frame these values, we need, we need to, to, to make a point before I get started. You know, the first would be that the Qur'an and Sunnah are the foundation of values. That in itself is a non-negotiable value of any Muslim. Recently on Instagram, a person wrote me a question. He said, can I, believe in, can I be a Muslim if I don't believe in the Qur'an? So I said to him, can you like Persian food if you don't eat kebab? <laughs> he said, oh, I, 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 didn't I didn't think about it that way. I mean, how would you be Muslim? if you don't believe in the Qur'an. And it's, it's upon us as educators to think about how do we furnish that and facilitate that for Muslims. How do we remind people of the beauty of the Qur'an and the importance of the Qur'an and having a relationship with the Qur'an, reformatting sometimes how people look. Like I teach a class of young people and I ask them, hey, like, when you think of Qur'an, what do you think of? And one girl said, my father beating me. That's her experience with Qur'an. That's a bad experience. How do we reformat that experience? Ask, how do you, when you hear the word Qur'an, what's the first thing you think of? And somebody said, I think of success. MashaAllah. So there, there's the way that we want to reformat how people see the Qur'an as this incredible source of guidance and something as the Qur'an says itself. The same word from Qiyam. The Qur'an guides to what's aqwam, yani the best values. The most honorable values, the Qur'an, it says itself. And this lies between hope and fear. So the first was that the mustar, the foundation of our values, is Qur'an and Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Quran's job is guidance. Allah swears by the stars, he swears by the Quran because the Arabs they used to use stars to guide them through difficult times while they were traveling. So just as the ancient Arabs used to use stars to guide them through difficult times of traveling, we use the Quran to guide us through the difficulties of dunya. Allah. That's why Sayyidina Shatibi, 
in his poem about the Qur'an, Imam Shatibi, subhanAllah, he wrote a poem more than a thousand lines on the different qira'at and he was blind. Ya Allah, he was blind! From Shatiba, the far east of Spain, eastern part of Spain. The far western part of Spain, excuse me. He said, وَبَعْدُ فَحَبْلُ اللَّهِ فِينَا كِتَابُهُ فَجَاهِدْ بِهِ حِبْلَ الْعِدَى مُتَحَبِّلًا وَأَخْلِقْ بِهِ إِذْ لَيْسَ يَخْلُقْ جِدَّةً جَدِيدًا مُوَالِيهِ عَلْ جِدِّ مُقْبِلًا He said, you know, you should hold on to the Qur'an like it's a rope. اعتصام بحبل الله The Qur'an. Because that's the role of the Qur'an. Its job is to be that rope when we find ourselves struggling. That pulls us out. So then as communities, as educators, as non-profits, whatever, we have to make sure that people have a relationship with Qur'an, not just, mashallah, memorizing the Qur'an, alhamdulillah, that's important, but that young people can ask questions about the Qur'an, for example. Parents can work together to talk about what are best practices to get our young people enamored by the Book of Allah. And what about elderly people now? MashaAllah, we have a huge baby boomer community. How can we keep them engaged with the Book of Allah as they prepare for death? That's just real talk. If we believe that the Qur'an is a source of guidance, then strategically now, we're going to act on that to facilitate engagement with the Qur'an. SubhanAllah, my teacher from Senegal, when I was learning from him, he said to me, there's only one time you, can say, you cannot say no to somebody in, in, in good. And I said, when? He said, if they want to study Qur'an. You can't say no. Because it's so important, it's so central to our lives. The second is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. تَرَكْتُ مَعَلَى الْبَيْضَاءِ لَيْلُهَا كَانَ هَارِهَا لَا يُزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَا هَالِكِ the Sunnah of the Prophet as a source of values, source of morality, source of ethics. Taraktu fikum amrain, I left you two things. You'll never go astray as long as you hold on to them, the book and the Sunnah. We tend to focus on the Quran and Sunnah as a community, strictly as legal documents. That's a problem. You know, the number of legal verses in the Quran, Imam al Ghazali said, are less than 400. Quran has more than you know, 600 pages. So to restrict the Quran simply to the Surah Tashri'i, a source of law, is a problem. The Quran is also a source of thought, a source of values, a source of wisdom. The Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, out of the 20,000 Sahih Hadith that are well known, only 5,000 are related to law. But if we restrict the role of this only to law, we lose a lot of things as a community, subhanAllah. So the first principle that we should think about is that the Qur'an and Sunnah are a source of values. A source for crafting thoughts and ideas. That takes me to the third source and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. And that is that some of these values are going to be agreed upon. Some of these values, you know, no one needs a PhD from Al-Azhar to, you know, say you shouldn't lie to your mom. You know, that you should be good to your neighbor. That I should be kind and, and caring. That doesn't need a PhD. So there are very clear we say nusus in Qur'an and Sunnah that make our values very clear. The second are that values are going to be negotiated. That depends on place, circumstance, situation, or we say ability. The Prophet said in the hadith of Abu Huraira, what I ordered you to do, do it as best you can. Like do do it as best you can. Istita'a, ability is going to be different according to the person. So there should be a sense of, you know, respect. 
There should be a sense of patience with others who may not be where you are. There should be a sense of understanding when trying to feel why are people maybe doing things a little different than me in the community. Because the greater portion of values are going to be negotiated by people. According to, most scholars said eight things, I'm just going to give you four. Number one is their physical ability. Number two is their intellectual ability. Number three is the environmental restraints which impact them. And number four is their emotional and psychological health and financial ability. So I gave you five. So for example, when Sayyidina Musa, he left Egypt, and his people said, Make for us idols. This is shirk. Did Sayyidina Musa go and write a Facebook post about his people and put them on blast, call out culture? Say, you are not going to believe what my people did today. <laughs> OMG. They left Islam. You know, Allah took us from Egypt, and the first thing they asked me to do was make them an idol. Hashtag kuffar. <laughs> he didn't do that. He said, innakum qawmu tujhalun. You're ignorant people. Why did he do that? Because they had Stockholm Syndrome. That's what they knew. So he engages them in, in their articulation of morals based on their ability, if you, if you think about what I'm saying. Sayyidina Isa, when in the end of Surah Maida, his followers, they said, هَلْ يَسْتَطِيعُ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يُنَزِّلْ عَلَيْنَا مَا إِلَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ قَالَ اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ They said, can Allah send a table? This is kufr, yani. Nobody in the community is going to be like, can Allah do this? Allah fa'alu lima yurid. Allah can do whatever he wants. But Sayyidina Isa, again, he didn't blow them up on Instagram. He didn't take it to the gram and say, these people are out of Islam. Imam al-Qutubi said, because they just became Muslim. That's their ability. Imam Sidi Khalil. Khalil in our madhab is a very important book. Imam Khalil, he said, you know, on, for example, the chapter of drinking alcohol and the punishment related to alcohol. He mentions, you know, what's the punishment of Sharab al-Khamr? But Imam Ibn Arafah al dusuqi in his explanation, he says, إِلَّا أَنْ كَانْ حَارِثًا لِلْإِسْلَامِ He said, unless it's a new Muslim. Why? Because maybe a new Muslim is going to come to Islam and have habits, which Islam hasn't sanitized yet. So we learn something very quickly here that those negotiated morals and even the foundational morality of our religion at often times have to take into consideration the people they address. Now, let me ask us, how complex is our educational philosophy in our Islamic schools? Do we take into consideration for example, people that have trauma in this country. Historical trauma, black America. Do we take into consideration when we're teaching people that their parents may have struggled as immigrants in this country? Do we take into consideration that people may have other challenges? Or do we just teach people to deem? What you what you're perhaps thinking about is, man, this is complex. It is. That's why the sheikh, in the verse he read, it's called amana. The deen is called amana. In the aradna al amana, it's a trust. It's not something haphazard. But I just showed you three important things, man. Quran number one and two, sunnah, our foundations of morality. Number three, that there is a component of morality. I didn't talk about this, which is left to community. And number four, that the expectation of people's ability to live these morals has to be taken into consideration, what we call takhrij al-manat and fatwa, has to take into consideration those people's ability. What happens is when we see somebody doing something different, we say, oh, that brother's changing the deen, this sister's going to change the religion. No, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, pray standing. But if you can't pray standing, what? Sit. It takes into consideration the ability of people. 
Sayyidina Musa, those people make for us idols. He didn't say you're not Muslim anymore. He understands. They've been through a lot. They're a traumatized community. And trauma is something that the Sharia is concerned about. That's why immediately after Uhud, when the Sahaba were traumatized, ثُمَّ أَنزَرَ عَلَيْكُمُ السَّكِينَةِ Immediately Allah removes the trauma from them. Then you read the lessons. Think about a Sultan Ali Imran. It doesn't just start by saying, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. Because they're already a traumatized community. They just lost the battle. But what does Allah say? We gave Sakina to you and we gave you sleep. And then when you woke up, we brought the pain. But the point is, as an educational wisdom, we learned the Quran takes care of people's psychological and emotional needs and instructs them. Look in Surah Quraysh. What does Allah say about the Quraysh? Wa amanahum in khawf. We protected them from fear. Then we sent a prophet to them. Any educators in here? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You got to take into consideration the state of the learner. Are we even thinking this way? So we find people in our communities traumatized, oftentimes by religious people. Because those religious people are unable to appreciate the nuance and intelligence needed to be truly prophetic in education. Because the articulation of values is going to change according to people's ability. The best example I can give you of this is in Surah Al-Hujurat. Wow, really? Man, I thought we had like a long time. We got 10 minutes left. I'm still in the introduction. In Surah Al-Hujurat, we find that people make the same mistake, but the way that that mistake is dealt with is different. So Abu Bakr and Omar, radiallahu anhumah, they raised their voice in front of Sayyidina Nabi sallallahu La tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. Don't raise your voice in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the verse ends, أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمَ أَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ If you don't stop doing this, we're going to cancel all your good deeds. Man, this is the last year in Medina. So how many good deeds did Omar and Abu Bakr have by that time? For all that to be canceled, that means the entire time you spent with the Prophet ﷺ could be rendered void. That's why after the verse came, Omar used to say, Ya Rasul. He, he was so scared, he started to whisper. He wouldn't speak. The prophet said, raise your voice. He said, yeah, man, I'm trying to lose all my good deeds, man. In the same chapter, so the sin they committed was they raised their voices in front of the say, of, of Sayyidina Nabi, alayhi salatu salam. The same chapter, the fifth verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجَرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ you know, those Bedouins who came and they yelled at you from behind your house. They yelled. Abu Bakr and Omar yelled. But Allah doesn't say to the Bedouins of, of Benu Tamim, an tahbata a'malukum. It doesn't say that. It says, Wallahu ghafur rahim. Allah is forgiving. The same sin, the same mistake, raising their voices, but the threat is different. Because the ability is different. SubhanAllah, it's very unique, this, these verses in Surah Hujurat. So, Quran and Sunnah, we didn't have time to talk about the third, and that is that communities and cultures have also been given a great frequency, religious communities, Muslim communities, to navigate what values are. Best example is Mahar. People always ask, what's the mahar? What's the mahar? There is no mahar, ya habibi. Why? Because the mahar is left to people to decide for themselves. What Imam Ibn Hazm called al maskutu anha. And the sharia ma fish khitab. The sharia didn't say anything about it. It's been left to people. And the fourth we said, we have to appreciate that people are going to struggle to practice these values based on a set of optics that we should be aware of before we minister to them or before we discipline them or before we censor them. We should understand what's happening to them. That's why Sayyidina Ahmed, Imam Ahmed, 
He was asked, you know, what's the qualities of a scholar? He said, ma'rifatun nas. You got to know the people. You can't simply just speak without knowing who you're talking to. As we run out of time, I just want to mention a few issues I think we can think about in the areas of values. For example, economic values. We have seen a, 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 a change in the world over the last 150 years. That after World War II, France burst what is known as the modern welfare state, which believes that the goal should be sufficiency. You know, welfare, the outcome is that people should be able to live sufficiently. Whether they live in poverty or where they live in a mansion, they still got a house. Whether it's government cheese or cheese from Whole Foods, they got cheese. Hence, those of us from America, as Rakim, he said, that's why they call it the projects, because it was a project. Language is very something we should take seriously. It's called the projects. It's a project. It comes out of the global welfare idea of Sufficiency. Clinton comes, or Matt Draka, my Clinton, <laughs> and we find like a neoliberal economic agenda which believes that sufficiency is not really important. What's important is human rights. So you could be broke and poor but you're not being thrown in jail, more or less. So one values human rights without sufficiency. The other, I thought we had a lot more time, so I apologize, has sufficiency without human rights. What's our value system economically, man? How do we view the goal of like a healthy economy? How do you attain ethics in capitalism? There's no, there's no saint in capitalism. Ask Jay-Z. And ask Colin Kaepernick, who works for Nike. It's very difficult to be a wali of Allah in a life that's pushing. And I'm not a communist, so don't freak out. I'm not a socialist. I'm just making us think. I'm a moralist. What would our understanding of the economy be? For example, what's the ruling on being a gentrifier as a Muslim? Haram. You ever heard of khutbah on how not to be a gentrifier? You'll hear of khutbah on jinns. That type of gentrification. <laughs> Sheikh, my house has been gentrified. <laughs> what Quran should I read? But you move to Anacostia. You're also gentrifying people. And maybe as shaitanic as the jinn you think lives in your restroom. <laughs> How not to be a gentrifier? How to be ethical in a capitalist system? How does our attitude towards ec the economy, what's the ruling on being zero waste as a Muslim? Almost wajib. Is there a ruling for using plastic bags in a grocery store? Yes. What's that ruling? Don't. What's the ruling on having your own bag when you go to the grocery store? Super encouraged. But see, we're busy arguing about hamburgers and music, man. We're caught up in Sunni Shia. We're plagued by particulars. So we can't craft a value-based message to the world. And we know there's business people in this room right now. If you don't have a value prop, you won't have investors. So what I wanted to do, and I, I didn't realize, I thought we had like an hour and a half, and that's OK, is to push you a little, to move beyond the institutionalization of religious thought in the Muslim community. There is an institutionalized thought, Shawshank Redemption, when you get out, do you really get out? 
And what happens, you see converts, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, or people who are not that religious, who are born Muslim, who come into the community with fire. They come into the community thinking about fashion, aesthetics, architecture, the environment, race relations. What's the ruling on buying at Target that contributes to the prison industrial complex when our brothers and sisters in faith are incarcerated? What is a value that says it's not allowed to get lost in your imagination and ignore what's in front of you? But nine times out of ten, when you sit down and talk with a Muslim, they will be off in some imaginary nonsense, man. And this is not to, to, to slam anybody hard. But when people would come to the prophet and ask him nonsensical questions, his answer always directs them to practical action. When is the day of judgment, O messenger of Allah? Man, what kind of question is this? Mata sa'a ya Rasulullah in Sahih Bukhari. What kind of question is that? The prophet also doesn't rebuke him or demean him. He says, ma'addattalaha, what you prepare for it. Look at that answer. When Jibreel says to the prophet, when is the hour? Hey, you and I both don't know. What are the signs of the hour? Oh, okay, because knowing the signs of the hour causes us to want to live responsibly. So he goes into detail. So what I was planning on doing is unpacking some of that this evening, maybe in another visit. But how do we, first of all, analyze this problem that we have as a community by finding value in things, A, that may never be solved, right? Number two is particulars that tend to entrap us. Like every year, do we really have to fight about the number of rakat for tarawih? Like, is that the job of a prophetic community to argue about this? Or should we be thinking about a bigger set of values that are rooted in our religion? When Muslims complain to me about sexual ethics in America, I ask them, well, what theory of sexual ethics have you presented as a counter? Oh, no, brother, I don't know, man. I've been busy. Like, you're playing Fortnite? But on the side, your side thing is, let me attack sexual ethics in America. Like, that's easy to attack as a Muslim. You don't agree with it, I don't agree with it. Okay, then provide an alternative. So what I would like to see happen, you know, is people engage, as my father-in-law talks about, reading the Quran in a deeper way. Looking at the Sunnah in a deeper way. And then being able to think about values. For example, as I finish, NYU, which is a great school, you should send your kids. But what I'm about to say will scare you. Uh, NYU, thank you. You said I can finish wherever I want. But now, you know, I pulled the needle off the record and <laughs> turned off the mixer. And, but at NYU, we had six suicides this year. Young people. Students, right? It's public knowledge. And, you know, when not allowed to, not Muslims, right? Not allowed, it does, doesn't matter, I'm just telling you so you, know, you understand. And some of the, the themes that came out of some of these things were that this age has no good left in it. Sometimes you hear Muslims are like, man, this is such a Dajalic, Dajalic age. Oh, no, it's not. The Dajjal will make this look like genital for dose. I gave a lecture on this on eschatology. It's on my, uh, it's on my uh, podcast where I talk about not so fast. Like, don't try to make the day of judgment now. It's a lot of things that have to happen. But what happens is we tend to selfishly see our own life in the broader frames of eschatology. Well, my life is bad, so the end of times must be near. You ain't that special. <laughs> I'm not that special. The jail's not coming because I lost my keys to my car. <laughs> but, and this is important, our scholars looked at life very differently. They didn't fall into extreme depression. They recognized depression was real. And they talked about the problems of difficult times. 
But their value system was that as long as I'm able to say Allah is good. As long as I have a moment for worship, it's good. So you look at Imam Ibn Arabi, the great Sufi, Sheikh Al-Akbar in Futuhat al makiyyah Immediately somebody, ooh, I heard, I heard Ibn Arabi, he's a deviant. Did you read his books? No. Did you meet him? No. Well, a value of our religion is that you're not allowed to judge someone of what you heard. Every time I give a talk, subhanAllah, I meet someone outside, they're like, you know, man, I read this about you. I'm just really so sorry because I shared it with like 40 of my friends. <laughs> and I said, what, what did they say I said? He said, you said gay marriage is halal. I never said that. <laughs> I said, are you going to send now back to your 40 friends that you and I made up? <laughs> but the point is, we're a community that Allah says, فَتُثْبِتُ Different qira'ah and warsh and nafi' and surah al-hujurat. You better know the person before you judge them, right or wrong. Sufyan al-Tawri, his best friend, most of the scholars of the hadith said he was da'if. He said, he's not da'if. They said, why? He said, man, I grew up with this dude. Me and this guy grew up on the same block. I know him. I know his mom. I know his dad. I know why he acts the way he acts, which makes you think he's weak, but he's not weak. For Imam Ibn Arabi, he went to Mecca, and he came back in the Futuhat, and his, his disciples, they asked him in Spain, who did you meet in Mecca? He said, I met the most successfully stupid human being I've ever seen in my life. He said, what? Successfully stupid? He said, successfully stupid. They said, why? And he said, he had a lot of followers, too. They said, wow, how? How could someone like this have followers? He said, I'm going to tell you. He said, I got to Mecca. I saw this man with large crowds of people following him. And I went to him and I said, who are you, mashallah? I thought he was a sheikh. I wanted to learn from him. So I said, who are you? What do you believe? What are you about? He said, when he started to talk, I realized he had no training. He was not formally trained. So he was a fake. He was a fake. He said he had a lot of filters, bought a lot of likes, right? Manufactured friendships, man. People buying friends nowadays. This guy sent me a message on Instagram. He said, I will get you the blue dot and 20,000 friends. So I clicked on his page. He had three friends and no blue dot. <laughs> I wrote back. I said, hey, man, how come you don't have a blue dot and you only got three friends? He's like, well, I'm not famous. I said, I'm confused, man. <laughs> Right? So this is a weird world, manufactured buddies, manufactured friendship. Ibn Arabi said, I said to him, then how did you get so many followers? Yeah, how did this happen? He said, I call to one thing, and people like it. And they follow me, and they rely on me for it. He said, what? He said, I told him that there's no good left in the world. And there's no good left in the ummah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he said, that is the most successfully stupid human being I've ever met in my life. That's a value. We don't worship time. We're beyond time. We are a transcendent community. If we get good, we are thankful for it. If we suffer, we are patient. Alhamdulillah. Dunya is not an end. This is a value. Dunya is a means. So now I'm able to think about things a little differently. How does that unpack in different areas of life? And it shouldn't be just to the shuk and imams. The sheikhs and imams can really talk about only one thing. That's being a sheikh and an imam. That's what you do. Would you give, you know, a sheikh or an imam the job of replacing John Wall? People said, how are you going to let the sheikh? Sheikh doesn't have a crossover like John Wall. Oh, but mashallah, he's so pious, alhamdulillah. Such a great sheikh, he prays Fajr every day in the masjid. There has no relationship, there's no correlation between that and having a mad crossover like John Wall does. If you don't know who John Wall is, you can Google that dude. And that's a value. We believe that the talent should be in the position, not the fame or the look. So when Umar al Khattab sees the adhan in his dream, does Umar become the mu'adhan? No. Why? He doesn't have a nice voice. It's simple. When Amr ibn As, uh, when, when uh, Abu Dhar goes to the Prophet and says, make me a leader, 
Abu Dhar has been a Muslim for a long time. And the Prophet says, no, 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 you're not for politics, bro. It's not your thing. But Khalid bin Walid, go lead. That's what you do. We look over and over in the history of the Prophet, Ali Salam, we see that the value of who's most apt for the job gets the job. Not piety, not religiosity. So we'll have people come into our communities who don't adhere to institutionalized notions of religiosity, but can do great things, and we will shun them from the community because they don't fall into that standardization model where they are the most talented. You know, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, I read one time, subhanAllah, somebody asked him a question. They were from the Mamaliks and they were being invaded by the Tartar. So he said, they asked Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, we're trying to decide on the general. We have two people. One is a very pious person who doesn't know how to beat up himself in a mirror. But he's pious. He doesn't know how to fight. He has no idea about military strategy. The other person, he drinks alcohol. But man, when it comes to knowing how to fight, ooh, that guy's a problem. Ibn Taymiyyah said, it is wajib for you to use the man who drinks in the position he's best qualified for. That's his fatwa. Look how short-sighted we are. So what I would like you to take, because of time, is we were talking about thinking about a framework for values. He said, ideally, we should be engaging in a deeper, more intimate, personal relationship. Some of those values, also, I didn't have time, will be crafted individually. Like, I, I worry about some of the questions people ask me. Like, for example, you know, should I do this with my husband or this with my wife or not? Like, you know, because they do this thing I don't like and she does this thing I don't like and like, I don't know you. I don't know, I don't know anything. I don't even know your name. But you can ask me to be like Dr. Phil and make a decision for your house. Or young people will be like, so like, I have two opportunities. One is to go to Brown. One is to go to NYU. What do you think? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. One time I was in Mecca. This lady came to me. She said, I had long beard then. She said to me, Anta sheikh? Are you a sheikh? I said, Li, ala shan al because you have a big beard. I said, Wallahi, Allah, ya tasna al shiyukh. The, the beard makes scholars? <laughs> she said, Ah, oh, dahu? She was from Saeed, ya sheikh. Saeed Masr. So I said, How can I help you? Wallahi, she asked me this question in her dialect of far southern Egyptian Arabic. I had no idea what she was saying. Like she was one of those Masris that says Dilwagi. Not Dilwati. Dilwagi. Even Egyptians are like Dilwagi. Yeah, that kind of one. The one who can watch Al Kabir Awi and understand the whole show. Yeah. So she asked me this question. I said, Busiya Mama. I said, I don't know. She said, Oh, you're not Sheikh. I said, أنا مش شيخ علشان مش أدري؟ آه علشان الشيخ يعلم كل حاجة. She said, because the sheikh, he knows everything. I said, everything? Okay. So let's go ask that sheikh what your son's name is. She said, لا, لا, I don't mean everything. I said, then what do you mean? We had this interesting conversation. The point is, then I understood she was asking me something about her crops. Her farm. And I said, yeah, mama, and I'm in Obama stand. I'm from Obama stand. I don't know about crops. And she said, oh, I'm the Mushik. I said, Allahu Akbar, who's the shuk if they don't know about your jazar, about your jazar, your carrots, man? Is it organic? Is it organic? Is it organic? I said, I don't know about this stuff, man. So that would be another value. Imams have their place. Religious leadership has their place. And when young people correct religious leadership, because they say things out of pocket, they're right. 
Because they can ask those brothers and sisters, have you been trained in what you're talking about? Have you, like, read any serious academic journals? Have you engaged in peer review? Has there been, like, a very deliberate process? No. So what I was encouraging us to think about today, and, and, and again, the time issue kind of threw me off, my apologies, is that as we think about values and a framework for values as being a means to medicate this very difficult time, we're in a time now where values are very strange. I mean, every day, man, something new happening, right? It's very stressful. It's a very stressful time. A, a good political leader, a responsible political leader, is not going to subject the people to constant strains. This is something in our principles of sultaniyya. You find in our books of the Ahkam and the Hukum. And then one of the things we should think about, I mentioned earlier, is are we a simple reflection of the dominant secular narrative in America, which has made now the edifice of conversation strictly political? I worry if we pigeonhole ourselves strictly into talking about politics, we're going to neglect so many other, I'm not saying neglect, again, we're not going to an extreme, but we're more than just politics. Number three is I, I, I said that being a reactionary community is also strategically very problematic. We should be a community that leads. And for that, we need a lot of people and very intelligent people and, and, and discourse, which pushes the envelope a little. And then the fourth, as I said, you know, we should think about some principles of our value system. Quran, Sunnah. Then we talked about how there are aspects of that which are non-negotiable. For example, worshiping Allah alone is non-negotiable. We talked about issues which are negotiable, usually having to do with like daily interactions, al-urf, al-a'raf, how we practice in the sense of our own cultural identity, perfectly acceptable. Then I gave some examples. I said that the fourth point that the Activification of these values will be based on people's ability, and we should understand that we're not a monolith and that people are in different places, come from different situations, different historical backgrounds, different financial situations, different intellectual backgrounds, you name it. So I should think about engaging people in a way which is merciful. I gave the example of Musa and his followers, and Isa and his followers, and then Omar and Abu Bakr. Then I, I, I prodded you a little, I opened the window, but I, I closed it really quickly to think about, like, for example, how do you practice Sufism in the age of capitalism? Like, why can't we think about fasting Monday and Thursday as being for Allah? But I don't wonder what the global impact on the world is if Muslims fasted on Monday and Thursdays, just like consumption. Is it a religious responsibility for me to limit my waste? When I see what's happening to the environment, when I see communities are going to be impacted in the future by my behavior, what's the religious ruling on using a plastic bag at, say, a grocery store? How do you bring in a sense of ethics? Like, we brought in BDS to the marketplace, which is admirable, is important. How do you bring Tawheed into the marketplace? And what we do is we say, let's create an Islamic, you know, like Islamic economic framework. That's impossible, it's not gonna happen, right? But how do you bring in your ethics to the existing economy, the existing setup in the world around us? How do I make sure, like, if I was gonna write a book of fiqh now on, on economics and buying and purchasing, I would say, you know, and it is highly dubious to purchase in a place that contributes to the military industrial complex. It is highly dubious to purchase in a place which is part of the prison industrial complex. It is highly dubious. And I tested this, man. You know the best place to see our values is the dua after the Friday prayer. You know what I'm talking about? Where we just say, I mean, we don't know what's going on. And you're like, yo, I gotta get to work, man. I mean this joint. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. So I started doing it in English. Started doing it in English, that was interesting. But then, for example, one of my khubas in my dua, I was saying, you know, Allahumma protect you know, Palestine, Kashmir, right? Those are very important things. Africa, these are very important. Bosnia, very, I mean, I mean, people, I mean, boy, that I mean, 
like a Pentecostal church on Sunday morning. Then I said, oh Allah, make us allies to black people and protect us from being those who contribute to the oppression of black Americans. I mean, <laughs> that I mean got quiet. I said, what happened to I mean? Now it's, I mean, right? And I realized, when you make dua for things that people have to be responsible for, I said, oh Allah, please help us limit our, our plastic. I mean, <laughs> oh Allah, help us not to be people who abuse people in our homes. I mean, I realize when you make dua for things that we're responsible for, the amin goes down. And I start to think, are we living theoretically through dua or practically through dua? And that's a value. Our scholars said that if someone gets so lost in the theoretical that they're unable to practice the practical and deal what's in front of them, this is religiously a problem. So I gave a few issues, practical application. How not, I gave a khutbah here in D.C. at the church downtown. I gave a khutbah, how not to be a gentrifier. Brother came to me, first time I've ever seen people come and be like, what was that fourth point? Because like, I had the sixth one that was like, don't shop here. But like, what was this one, right? It wasn't like, got to go to work, bye. It was like, okay. I can take this khutbah home and talk about it with my family, man. So I would like to encourage you when you go home within your own space, your engagement of the Qur'an, to think about your context of the Qur'an. What are the messages and the wisdoms of the Qur'an in your life and how you can apply them. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakamallahu khayran wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And, and let me just make a, a, a quick uh, two points. We can never underestimate how we've been affected by the assumptions of the West. This idea that we're free. Like, people always ask me, like, you know, if God knows what I'm going to do, why should I do it? You always get this question, right? Like, the notion that we can be free of God. There's a great podcast you should listen, listen to called under, your undivided attention. It's, it's, it's actually put together by the guy who invented the infinite scroll. Those of us who are older, you remember where you couldn't infinitely scroll back in the days? So you spent less time on your phone. And Snake wasn't a fun game to play. <laughs> right? But, and he talks about, for example, this, this notion that somehow we're free of God. Like, you know, if I could be free of religion, I'll be free. This is an assumption of the West because the West has a problem with religion in general. The assumption of the West, and even now the, the secular East, is that religion is buffoonery. That religion doesn't have much to offer. So you should be free of it. You should free your mind and the rest will follow. We know that song. Listen to that podcast, man. And listen to an NYU professor, mashallah. Dr. Shaw, who did her PhD from Berkeley on casinos. And she says that when you go into a casino, the first thing you want to look at is the lights. I'm sure no one here has been in the casino, so we don't need to worry about it. But you know, when you go into a casino, the first thing you want to do is like, wow, ooh, man, this is crazy. Look at the chandelier. It's like the chandelier in Mecca. But the point is, maybe that's why they bought it. The Saudi guy probably bought it there. Government, not the people. And BS probably bought that when he bought that big picture of Jesus. For $14, billion, $14 million, he bought a Jesus piece, man. So, a white Jesus too. So she, <laughs> she said, but what you should be looking at is the carpet. Because if you look at the carpet in the casino, there's no right angles. The reason there's no right angles is they don't want you to make a choice. They want you just to flow. And then she says, I studied the carpet of casinos. This girl did a PhD in carpets and casinos. And she said, I uncovered that the flow of the carpet 
takes you to the slot machines. Then she said, I begin to investigate slot machines. There are 400 sounds a slot machine makes. They are all middle C. I don't know if we have musicians in here, but you know what middle C is. It's the most harmonious note. People love middle C. So whether you win, ding, 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 whether you lose, ding, 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 it's all ding, 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 baby, you good. <laughs> Here's the point. She said, I interviewed people. The idea of being free, to be free. You know, I need to remove religion from me to be free. This is one of the assumptions of the West. That poisons a lot of Muslims. And let's not talk also about bad religious experiences and evil religious leaders. That also contributes to this. And bad parenting. But she said, I met PhDs who wear diapers when they go to the casino because they will not go to use the restroom. She said, I went in the alley of the casinos when they have this shutdown period, and I saw them rinsing slot machines because of the urine. People are sitting there, man, are they really free? So that's an assumption. And when we talk about religion, one of the great assumptions of the West is that religion imprisons people. But when you become free of God, who do you become the slave of? Because you're not free. You're not free. When you and I go on Facebook, there are a thousand engineers against you and me. And now it has AI. AI is worse than a thousand engineers. At least the engineer has some emotions. And they're constantly going to drive you. What they now call consumer fatigue. We used to think about fatigue and standing in Salah. They talk about being able to, and that's why even the chair at the slot machine is an origami chair that gives you the best optimum blood flow. But the assumption is that the world will give you freedom. Think about what Imam Ibn Ajiba, he wrote in his book on the stations of Tasawwuf. He said, the highest station of Tasawwuf is freedom. Freedom to be with Allah. We don't talk about these things. Values. Another, sorry brother, anyone watch The Family yet? On Netflix? Oh yeah, The Family. Look how we got played in the criticism of the family. The biggest criticism of the family, that's my daughter, mashallah. I know, I know, I'm, I'm coming. The biggest criticism of the family, we should be careful, is that the problem with these people is that they're religious. I have no problem with that. As a Muslim, I have no problem with people being religious. But that's the dominant criticism now. It's these religious people that are lobbying the government. Okay, what about irreligious people who lobby the government? What about people who lobby the government on behalf of the military industrial complex who aren't religious? They're given a free pass. So the bigger issue is I could care less if these Christian dudes on, what was it, C Street have worked to try to influence government in a way that they feel is aligned with their spiritual values, I have no problem with that. I don't agree with the outcomes of it. But again, if we're not woke, and I hate to use that word, we fall into the assumptions of a world which we might necessarily align with. I have no problem. When Ibn Qayyim was asked, what should the Zoroastrian community do in Damascus when there's Sharia courts? He said they should go to Zoroastrian courts. And they're like, what, Sheikh? Are you saying that Zoroastrians shouldn't go to the Sharia court? He said, why would Zoroastrians go to a Sharia court? They don't believe in Sharia. They got their own religion. We're not worried about how they deal with their lives. Let them deal with their lives. There was not a problem with religion. The, the dominant criticism now of the family on Netflix is that because these people are religious, they must be bad. Whereas Roger Goodell, and other power players in this country. One died today. Nobody has a problem with them. Because they're not doing it in the name of... I, I, 
You see what I'm saying? We, don't, we, we value people's religious beliefs. People want to believe, God bless them. Even if it doesn't align with our religious beliefs, God bless you. I have a problem with the outcome, right? So the outcome of what they believe, what they lobbied for, that's my concern. But the fact that they were motivated by religiosity, I could care less about that. But you'll never hear a criticism in the West of heathen secularism. Why isn't, why isn't that unfettered capitalism blamed for gentrification? But these guys are blamed for being religious. So we need to think deeper in a sense of our values. So I just wanted to add that to the end of my apologies <laughs> to make us think a little differently. Mm. Um, how do you pra um, recommend practicing patience, taking the time to learn? Um, all of the, the references you noted are really important references, right? Those are lessons to draw from. I don't have those information. Yeah, um, I know. How do you take time to learn that and develop your, <coughs> the things that we are good at? Yeah, I mean, anyone, I don't know if anyone follows me on Facebook. If you don't, you're not a good person. Um, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just so wrong. That's, but that's how life is nowadays. You meet someone, you follow me on Facebook, no. <gasps> no, but I, I'm not bad. Like, I just don't follow you on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. I got babies. Um, but that's a great question. And one of the things that I post today is the importance for imams and religious leadership to be accessible to you. They're not. That's a value. We believe that's a value. Imam Suyuti writes in Ashbab al it is fald kifaya that every city has a scholar that is accessible to people. This is a community obligation. And this is why sometimes my fellow imams get upset with me. I'm like, you will argue that Trump needs access to you, but she doesn't have access to you. And who's more important to me, you or Trump? You. It's, it's more of an obligation that my, my own family, this is my, my little daughter right here, is accessible to me before power, because power corrupts. I have a problem with the, the, my brothers and sisters in the imam world who have forgotten that you got to be there for people, free of charge. All profits were nonprofit. <laughs> Get paid, because we got, hey, I got some bills, right? Family ain't, I'm not watching the family for free. But be the Snapchat imam. Be the Instagram. That's why I did that Q&A for people on Instagram. You got to do that because you got to be accessible because you said something profound. Literacy is baked. It's not microwaved. And these are very serious issues. And there's another reason why you got to be accessible because you got something to teach me. You have something within your life that if you and I had a conversation, you would share with me and I would say, oh man, I got that wrong, oh my God. Right, it, it, quality control. So one of the things that we need to think about is when we hire imams and we hire religious leadership, we actually have a job description for them. I've been imam before in America, that's like being a running back in the NFL. Three or four years, you blow your ACL. And then you have being a personal trainer at Planet Fitness, <laughs> right? The point is, being an imam is a tough, man, man, God bless those guys. That's a tough, oh, Lord have mercy. That is a tough job, all right? It's not easy. But I've never been given a job description once. I remember one time this, this community offered me a job. I said, do you have a job description? They said, well, we just want Imam Siraj Wahaj. I said, uh... <laughs> I have to immediately disqualify myself from eligibility for obvious reasons. 
right? There was no job description. And in that job description should be, you will be expected to be accessible to people, you know, three or four hours a week, it's open office hours, that you, primarily having conversations with a group of people on issues. Number two is, don't, and I said this, don't sell short what you have to offer. You also have something to share in that conversation. You know, I, I put online, I said, I need 30 people, uh, 10 people under 20 to create like a little council for me to talk with me about issues. Man, it's amazing. I was like, man, I, honestly, I don't know much. I mean, I talked to them, I was like, wow, it's a completely different world, man. Like, it's very different than when I was, quote unquote, young. Like, I got a lot to learn. So there needs to be this communal buy-in locally. But if imams are busy having prawns in the White House, you know what I'm saying? And I get it, that's important. I don't think imams should be, imams aren't statesmen. We got statesmen in the Muslim community who are statesmen. We have people in the Muslim community who know how to engage politics. And Ezhar, they just taught us to be quiet and rubber stamp politics, to submit and surrender and be quiet in front of CC, not to speak truth to power. So then how could I be someone that's speaking in politics? So the job of the imam is to teach and to learn. And, and we need to push for this as an American Muslim community. And I get after 9-11, we were all forced. We were all, you know, regurgitated, if you will, to be on the front lines. And that's why I quit Boston. I was the imam in Boston. You know why I quit? I was like, I'm at CNN. I'm a CBS. I'm not a Fox. They're talking about me. I'm just not there. But I'm not teaching. So I quit being an imam to be an imam. What does that tell you? So the point I'm trying to say is, what you said is real. And there needs to be a demand. Listen, we don't need you in these places, man. God bless you. That's great. You're flying all over the world and doing this and that. But your people are dying, man. You know? And, and that's where, in the last week on Instagram, I had two young Muslims who died of cocaine overdoses. It's a real problem in our community. Are we, are we trying to help people? Did I have issues with substance abuse? I'm traveling all over. I, can't, I don't have time. And then you don't create students. So when you die, there's a big vacuum. So I say number one is having a conversation with local religious leadership and saying, listen, man, like we need you, dude. We need that religious personal trainer. And we need to share with you some things we think will help you also in your, your vocation. And then we need to have like long-term conversations. Like, I guess a lot of the community members share your frustrations about what's going on in the community and the lack of the imam's ability to deliver the message. I'm going to read my statement and a question related to what the sister has uh, indicated. The institutionalization of Islam is the abstract understanding of Quran, an individual or a collective, more than Imam's role. The interpretation of the Quran became superficial, which separated Muslims from adherence to the core, the core of the Quran, driving many away or even leading some to atheism due to lacking his deed or progressive thinking. People trust Imams as a matter of expert to educate them on Islamic issues, but many speeches develop timidness in our thinking provide no answers. Uh, the imam reads a book and comes on the member and delivers something that is literally known to the majority of Muslims. Problem with packaging of Islamic guidance, if a mom uh, always would cook fattened food, the kids would always eat that and would never know that there's a healthy alternative. So how do we inspire and facilitate progressive thinking, provoking thoughts and khutbas in our communities? It's rare to hear any really thought-provoking khutbas in our communities. Imam get involved in all aspects of the masjid, finances, parking, interfaith, but they forget building the schools. How do we, as community members, facilitate that and bring change? Yeah. Because we, that's, that's what's pushing us away from Islam. And, you know, you hear stuff on YouTube and, you know, by some imams and you feel like, wow, is this really the meaning of the ayah? I've never heard this from an imam of masjid. Right. And that's why I'm not into the practical understanding of the Quran and Islam. So there's a lot, lot to us. That's like that's a big question. No, don't be sorry. It's okay. Speak, speak your, speak your truth. 
So first of all, I, I need you to appreciate how hard it is to be an imam in America. It's a tough job. Let me give you an example. I worked at a community. I moved once across the country to another community. Moved everything. Packed up everything, right? Six months into the job, brother comes to me and is like, we can no longer pay you. What? Any other job in America, will they do this? Man, Uber won't even do you like this. So I, I think before, before we, I'm not saying you, but before we put it all on the imams, because we like to do that, have we created healthy environments of employment for imams? I do it's like every community I've ever worked in, I could be fired after any Friday prayer without notice. So I think we need to be cautious that oftentimes our imams are under tremendous financial pressure. I mean, it, it's real. And oftentimes the governance of the masjid is more to blame than the imam. All right? Doesn't mean all imams are perfect. I, I know. We've got the good, the bad, and the ugly, like everything. But I'm saying, in my own experience, I will never, ever be an imam again in this country. I, I swore to Allah. Allah knows. Because it's hard, man. It's hard on your family. It's hard on you. I weighed 360 pounds as an imam in this country. A, month, a year later, I was down to 275. What does it tell you? Well, brother, what were you eating? Man, I wasn't eating. I couldn't afford it. They cut my salary in half. I mean, unless you're rich, it's whole check, not whole foods. So I think first we need to examine the governmental structure of our nonprofits and see how that has impacted the intellectual production, right? You look at some of the national organizations where people that have been in power now for more than 50 years are still in the same situation. They haven't moved on. They haven't passed the baton. It would be very difficult to be an imam for someone like that because they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're not going to give you any room. I was at a community. I was told, you've made this community too black. I swear to God, a board member said that to me. I said, how? He's like, well, you know, that Lupe fiasco prayed here. And you know all this hibbity bobbity bop, bop. <laughs> and I said, I'm not responsible for what people listen to. But I said, did you just say black? I resigned two weeks later. Like, imagine trying to lead that. And that's the same person that stands up and says, Wallahi, we love our black brothers and sisters. No, you don't. No, you don't. Don't lie. At least be honest, like you were with me. When you try to say, hey, maybe the sister side shouldn't be all ratchet and moldy. Maybe we can hire a woman scholar. And then people tell you, you're a Nazi feminist. That's a tough job, man. So I would say also that imams sometimes don't have the support of the community. The community will say, bi ruh bi dam, right? But as soon as the imam gets in trouble, wallahi ya imam, rabbana ikramkum, inshallah, may Allah give you what's better. I thought you bi ruh bi dam. No, 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 ma bi shuruh, wala bi dam, wala haga. So a lot of times the imam doesn't have local people to support them either in front of extremely unfettered, powerful boards that are usually dominated by donors that don't even come to the mosque. That's a problem. The third thing is, we don't ask people for their qualifications. You know, I, I mean, I, I've run into young people sometimes, they listen to someone on YouTube, and, the, and that person will say, like, what happened to Ibn Arabi, right? And they say something so insane. Right? And then I'm like, okay, let's investigate who this person is. And I actually investigated who one of these people were. I found out this dude was selling Samsung mobile phones in Jeddah, but then he had like a tawb and the qutr, and he used to put it on and he had a camera, and he would come on camera and just talk. So because he had the tawb and that on, 
they thought like, wow, it's the Sheikh. Like Shawqi said, يعني مخطئون من ظن يوما إن اللي ثعر بدينا. أحمد Shawqi said, you know, even if the fox dresses like a Sheikh, he's still a fox. He's going to eat you. But we don't ask for qualifications, right? We don't say like, hey, you know, with all respect, you know, God bless you. Have you had any kind of formalized education? You know, have you gone to like, say, university, Azhar, Damascus, Ibn Khaldun? You know, has there been somewhere where you've been subjected to peer review? You've gone through a process. And we should also ask them, you know, your attitude towards women, what's your attitude towards black people, what's your attitude towards converts, what's your attitude towards non-Muslims? Like those are conversations that should be had. We just hire people. We, we, we don't even know who they are. I remember, subhanAllah, one of my teachers in Azhar, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Hijazi. He, he was sent to the countryside where they didn't have any type of television stations. This is before the dish. They just had the radio. So he went there, and there was a guy in the mosque dressed like, a, you know, wali min awliya illa. And then the sheikh, he's, uh, Dr. Hijazi, he's from Balagha, he said, in rhetoric, he said, man, who's that guy? And they said, oh, this sheikh, he visits us from Cairo every month, and we pay him. He said, really? What's his name? They said, Dr. Abdurrahman Hijazi. That's him. <laughs> he said, what? They said, yeah, he teaches in the Department of Rhetoric in Al-Azhar. He's like really famous. And he was like, hold on a minute. So he went to the guy. He was like, assalamu alaikum. Like, man, I'm so honored to meet you. Oh my God, who are you? He's like, ana fadilat al-ustad al-alama, Dr. Abdurrahman Hijazi, min al-Imbaba. Anyone from Egypt, you know Imbaba? Imbaba. That's where Sheikh Hijazi is from. So then he said, I knew the guy was trying to be like me. Then I said, what's your kunya? He said, Abu Amr. I'm Abu Amr. <laughs> this is identity theft, man. So then he said, really? Can I see the yeah, bita'a, you know, your uh, identity card? He's like, wallahi, uh, laqad nasit al bita'a, yani, I forgot it. And uh, he said, really, where do you live? He said, I, I, I live in, uh, in Kailobi. I thought you said you lived in Mbaba. And then he started to go in on him. And then he said, L allow me to introduce myself to you. Allow me to clear my throat. <laughs> he said, yes, he said, I am Dr. Abdurrahman. Hijazi Abu Amrin from Mbaba. Here's my bitaka. Here's my card. And then they found out this guy had been coming and just saying nonsense. Right? Put some of that coconut oil on the forehead, get that noor, you know? And then, wow, the Sheikh is such a pious person. Ooh. That's the problem. We don't ask for qualifications. The fourth thing is we don't teach congregants what to look for. And we need to educate people. For example, if the sheikh says to a young woman, hey, let's hang out later. No. <laughs> but he's so pious, mashallah. I, I interviewed one time a young woman that had been mistreated by this clown. And she said to me, well, you know, I just thought he was so pious, he could do no wrong. Girl, who are your parents? No disrespect. Come on now. You know, do you listen to R&B? Like, do you listen to Joe or Tyrese? Like, this stuff will come out on the rents. Why would a sheikh want to meet you at night somewhere? I just thought, mashallah, you know, he was so pious, he was going to show me he could capture a jinn. <laughs> Gentrification. <laughs> so we need to be able to teach our young people, look, we, we respect the knowledge of these people, but there are ethical things, and, and people in, our, in congregants, but they're, for example, asking for money, you know, engaging people in things which are unethical, um, mistreating people and abusing people. I've seen the emotional abuse, right? Those are things we should, are, again, that goes back to your question, you should be like a, a larger kind of public knowledge around this. A challenge that we have, and also back to her question is, we don't have a monoculture, we're not all Malay, we're not all Desi, we're not all Arab, right? So within other communities across the globe where Muslims have left and settled, when there's that monoculture, they are able to craft literacy because it's easy. We're, we're, we got 91 ethnicities in the room right now. 
The last point, I think, is that we have to begin to craft what it means to be a religious scholar in America. What does it mean to be an imam in America? What does it mean to be an imam or a sheikh within the contours of America? So that means, I don't like to use the word progressive thought. I have a problem with progressivism because it, it's an assumption that, hey, we're better. I like to use healthy ideas. Because there may be things from the past which are actually progressive. And there may be things now which are retrogressive, right? It's not simply a chronological issue. It's a value issue for us. Right? Just because it's new doesn't mean it's right. So I would say that also we need, need to start to think about, and this is a discussion um, that has to happen. And, and, and that's why I have a problem with conferences. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy conferences like anyone else. I think they perform an important thing. But all this brain energy we have in these conferences, you know, we could be creating side and parallel sessions for people and say, okay, if you're an expert in this, go here. If you're an expert in this, go here. If you have a passion for this, and then you have someone facilitate conversations that turns into like, these are recommendations, these are journals, these are ideas that the community has. Because until now, when we, when we tend to think about the American Muslim Imam, it's like the activist I said earlier, what's the language, what's the theo linguistic approach of the American Muslim activist? And she was like, I don't have any religious language for my activists. Well, then what are you acting on? When we want to hire an imam or hire a religious teacher, what are the qualifications we're looking for within the parameters of where we are? And I, I can say this, I live in New York City. An imam in Harlem could not work in Brooklyn. An imam in Brooklyn would have a hard time in Harlem. They're just two different places. The, the personalities are so different. So there would also need to be a regional toning. Right? For example, in Washington, D.C., I would assume that having some kind of public media, some set of public media skills would be important for an imam. It's Washington, D.C. It's a very different place. So, you know, there's also got to be a regional definition brought in. But this is a big undertaking. And, and, and again, I take religion very seriously in this way. I think we don't take religious thought. We don't take language seriously. Right? We, didn't, we think about the word values, qiyam, qawama, yuqim, yaqama, qawm. Why do we call people qawm? Because they have enough values that they can stand. So, like, we have a lot to share, man. But it has to be pushed. And the last thing is I think we have to stop looking for answers strictly from religious people. You may find the answer on your own, in your own intimate reading of the text. There's nothing wrong with it. Imam Razi was asked. He said, the majority of the Quran can be understood by anybody. And there is a personal relationship you have with God. There is a, an interaction between you and your Lord that and I, when we sit down and read the Quran, it takes us somewhere. We need to appreciate that. Then, before, of course, before we, you know, go and act on that and create some problem, maybe, we should ask people. That's the job of the sheikh. I told some imams, I said, your job is tech support. Your job is tech support. People call you, they need something. But your job is not to be like the lenses by which people see life. Your job is to support people and correct people and help people understand. And that's your job as an imam. So Allah Allah.